Hey guys, um, so tonight we're going to talk about vascular disorders. And so this is a longer extended version. Um, I also have a shorter kind of differentiating arterial versus venous problems. Um, but if you're looking for a more extended in-depth version, this is what you're looking for. So um, vascular disorders are talking about problems of either your arteries or your veins. So when you hear PVD, um, you know, a lot of people think peripheral venous disease, but most of the time they're talking about peripheral vascular disease. So it could be a problem in your arteries or it could be a problem with your veins. That's why, you know, here soon we'll talk about, you know, kind of what your, um, you know, what the names are of the problems with your arteries and the names of the problems are with of your veins. And this is one of those things that a lot of times students can get caught up on their exams as they can get kind of confused and mix them up. So really try to, you know, start looking for these differences. So I have a couple of crazy um, rhymes that I came up with one semester. So the first one is um, Venus is warm with pulses abound. Arterial is cold with pulses that are hard to be found. So here's giving you a little clue that one difference between our Imperial problems and venous problems is whether there's a pulse present or not. How, what's the temperature, um, you know, of the, of the extremity. And usually when we're talking about peripheral vascular disease, we're talking about the legs is usually the uh, most commonly affected um, extremity. So um, <clears throat> when you're thinking about this, you really have to think about, you know, okay, well, an artery, what does an artery do? And so kind of to back up a little bit to get back into your patho and stuff like that is your arteries are responsible to <clears throat> excuse me, are responsible to bring um, oxygen rich or filled with oxygen blood and drop it off in your tissue. So effectively, it is the one that's dropping off the brand new product off to your, um, you know, your toes and your fingers, etc. It's dropping off all that oxygen. So its job is to get to, you know, those extremities without, without any blockages. And so if I have a problem getting flow places. So this is going to be more of what we call like an ischemia problem or lack of blood flow. That's what an arterial problem is. I am driving the arterial choo-choo train to try to get to that, that extremity and get that blood flow. But if there's a problem there, then what is it going to feel like if I'm not getting blood flow? What does it feel like? It's cold. There's no pulse because there's less flow. And we're going to talk about some of the other symptoms that they might have as well. We're on the other hand, venous problems. This is, um, remember veins, they are carriers. They're kind of our um, <clears throat> slower drop off um, rather than like the fast choo-choo train trying to bring um, blood quickly to the tissues. The um, venous system is slowly um, transporting blood back to your heart. Um, and it's not in a rush. It's real more laid back. The, you know, um, arterial blood vessels are very like firm, hard, and uh, I should say firm and hard. But what I should say is more, they're more, um, they're more fixed, whereas v, uh, veins, they're laid back. They're like, okay, guys, we're moving this blood. We'll get there. We're getting back to the heart. We've already oxygenated. We're just carrying you back so you can do it all over again. So they're not in a rush. So, um, you know, the, pretty much the job of the veins is to get blood back from the tissues that's dropped off and gave all that oxygen and bring it back to the heart. But in order to do this, it has to have what we call a muscle pump. In other words, in our calves, there's muscles that help to push and kind of, um, you know, kind of give a squeeze to help pump blood back up to our heart because it's literally, it's going against gravity because most of us don't sit there and lay in bed all day long. Um, and most of us don't lay with our legs up in the air toward our head. So usually our legs have to overcome gravity to get blood back to our hearts. So they need a little bit of help. So if we have a problem with our veins, kind of think like heart failure, where um, this is a, like a pump that's not working to get blood back up to your heart. And so what happens is it pulls. So if there's blood pooling, unlike when there's an arterial problem, when blood pools, it's warm. Um, there's good pulses because there's, there's no problem getting flow. It's just, it's not the fluid's not moving in the right direction. It backs up. So that's really that difference there between arterial and um, venous issues is arterial is like, like it says here, like an ischemic issue. Think like leg angina, like um, chronic stable angina, but in your legs. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. 
whereas um, PVD, which usually the other PVD, and I promise on the exam, it won't say PVD and be talking about venous. It's always going to be talking about peripheral vascular, which usually actually refers most the, the we're going to talk about this in a second, but the most serious one that we can talk about here is arterial because that's literally like, hey, there's a blockage. But anyway, let's just back up. So the PAD is the angina. There's a blockage. I'm not getting blood flow where the P VD peripheral venous disease, um, what do you call it? That is talking about a heart failure or a backing up of blood. There's blood pooling. There's not a lack of flow. Um, what do you call it? Like where there's like, um, like an actual blockage. It's just not getting pumped forward and it's kind of just pooling and hanging out in my legs. So here's another thing that's going to help you differentiate. Venus has edema and the legs are browned and they're browned because there's all that pooling um, of that um, dark blood in those uh, those calves and uh, you know uh, the uh, the back of the the back of the leg and the ankles I should say the calf and ankle area um, and then arterial is pale and shiny all around so it's pale because there's no flow and then it's shiny um, it's actually because and then you actually get very hairless as a result of arterial stuff because there's no blood flow my hair can't grow if there's no blood a flowing so. Anyway, if you're really confused, I promise we're going to go in deep. And, you know, the, the really important things to notice here is, is like you, you should be able as a nurse to be able to look at a patient's legs and tell if they have an arterial or a venous problem. And we're going to kind of break down why, how would those look different? Um, these are some of the big things here. And there's a really good video um, that Simple Nursing does. Um, um, about the difference between the two. Um, but with arterial, um, you know, there, there's no edema. Um, the pulse is weak. It's pale. It's cold. If they're sores, they're usually on the toes or on the bottom of the feet. Um, and then they're usually round and smooth. Um, and whereas with venous problems, um, instead of having like arterial problems, like an ischemic pain. So think of like when people have chest pain and they're like, oh, my chest hurts. For these people, they're like, oh, my leg hurts. Whereas with, um, that's with arterial problems because it's an ischemic pain. I don't have oxygen. Ouch, I'm hurting. Whereas with venous, it's actually like a completely different pain. It's more of a dull, achy pain. I'm um, kind of like a cramp. Um, and it's usually they have edema because remember there's the pooling of the blood. Um, there's a really good pulse because there's no problem with blood flow then they have these really crazy sores that have like irregular borders um and a lot of their stuff happens you know around the calf um uh, you know what do you call it maybe the top of the foot but um it's uh you know uh, it's more on like the front and the back in those like browned areas where the blood is pooling versus on the toes um so yeah so those are some of the big things but that's what i'm saying like you should be able to look and be able to see and kind of say oh, okay this has to be an arterial problem these are the kind of things you want to look for so um, let's look at uh, treatment and prevention. So when I was talking about the ulcers look a little different. We also need to treat them a little different because there's two different problems here. With arterial ulcers, I have an ulcer because I literally am not getting blood flow. Because I'm not getting blood flow, uh, what do you call it? Skin breaks down and then it can't heal because there's no blood flow. Um, so what I want to do, and we're going to kind of talk about this when I talk about arterial problems, think like an A here with my fingers. Um, I want to keep my legs in a dependent position. And a lot of students get confused with this deep Dependent means down. So think D for down. So that means like I'm sitting up in a chair right now. So my legs are dependent. Um, so um, what do you call it? We like to keep their legs down. And how does that help? Well, if I'm having a trouble getting blood flow to my feet to heal an ulcer, then what's going to help? It's going to help if I go ahead and let gravity do some work for me and help to flow down to my feet. Um, dry, sterile dressings are super helpful um, because, you know, we're really worried about infection here and it getting worse because they don't have flow to actually help them with that that um, wound healing. Uh, they usually need systemic antibiotics. Um, pain medicine is key because these can be very painful wounds. Um, even though they have less flow and they may have some paresthesias and other things, it can also be very painful. Uh, the big thing with these is we really want to watch them because if they're not healing correctly, we can end up having to go to amputation. Um, and then good nutrition, vitamin A and C are great for wound healing. 
Uh, and really for preventing these, think all the things that we do for diabetic foot care, because it's the same thing in diabetes, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, you know, the glucose breaks down the sensation, the nerves that um, tell you, you, hey, I have a scab on my foot or something on my foot. And then it, um, you know, it doesn't heal because it can't because um, all the blood vessels are broken down because of all the glucose in the blood. And this is very similar where this is an ischemic process. There's not flow to um, this area. And sometimes these people have decreased sensation in this area because they have decreased flow. So what we need to do for them is really teach them all that diabetic foot care, you know, keeping their foot moisturized, um, you know, making sure to wear well-fitted shoes, never go barefoot, watch your feet daily, um, wash and watch. That was supposed to, uh, I think I kind of said them at the same time, wash and watch your feet daily. Um, and, um, uh, you're really going to need to teach them about these common places they're going to have them because remember with arterial, you're, they're usually, um, you know, there can be on around the toes and the bottom of the foot is very common. On the other hand, arterial ulcers. So you kind of see the difference here. We remember we said they're kind of in the calf, ankle area a lot of the times in the front or the back of the leg often. Um, for these, we want to do good wound care and surgical debridement because remember the other ones, they're kind of like the nice clear, uh, not nice clear, excuse me, I should say nice circle, um, like really normal borders for the arterial where these kind of have crazy, um, you know, kind of crazy, um, I don't want to say crazy designs The like the simple nursing always describes it as like different types of pools, like, you know, the, um, for the arterial, it's like, it's a regular circular pool. And for this kind of ulcer, it's shaped like a weird, like squiggly pool, you know, all in a different direction. I'm not explaining that well, but, um, you can watch the video, it'll make more sense. And you're like, oh, she's not crazy. <laughs> so, um, needless to say, um, with these, um, ulcers, you know, they're more irregular and they need a lot of wound care often. Um, they may need cultures and antibiotics for treatment um, or skin grafts, which is where they have to put a new layer of skin on. Pain medicine and, and um, the good nutrition are important. Um, the ways to prevent venous ulcers is very different. So remember, um, what do you call it? For arterial ulcers, I want to be um, dependent because I want good flow because I'm having ischemia where I'm not getting blood to there. For venous problems to prevent them, um, I, I wanna stop that pooling. And so venous problems, remember I'm having problems getting the blood back up to my heart. So when you think V, put your fingers like this, V for venous, um, then I want to elevate my legs. So elevating my legs, helping to create, you know, that, um, what do you call it, um, the less resistance. Like when I'm sitting right now dependent, this is horrible for a venous pr person that has problems with, um, you know, um, venous buildup and fluid buildup because um, my everything's flowing down. I want stuff to, I need help flowing back up. So if I laid back and sat in a recliner and elevated my legs, they wouldn't have so much resistance to have to fight against. Um, um, compression also helps. So if my muscle pump, like if I'm in, let's say I'm stuck in bed and it's not even that, um, what do you call it? Um, that I have any other problems except that I'm just immobile. I'm not moving around. I need something to compress me, um, not compress me. I should say compress my calves to create that muscle pump, that squeeze that I need to pump the blood back up to my heart in my veins. And so that's why patients wear SCDs. This creates a muscle squeeze or muscle pump to pump that blood back to, and that's not, I shouldn't say that's the reason they wear them because we do them to prevent blood clots, but we'll talk about that later. Um, but we do it to help the venous system in order to help get that squeeze. Um, and then um, the other thing is movement. So when I get up and walk around, I get that really good calf squeeze. My calves are squeezing, pushing blood back up to my heart to help me to keep that momentum and whatever activity that I'm doing. So the, so in other words, I want you to start thinking as a whole, because I'm talking about ulcers here, but this is a lot of the stuff that's going to help you when we're talking about, okay, here's an arterial issue. What do I need to do? Here's a venous issue. What do I need to do? So arterial problems, we want to dangle or we want to get dependent where we want to um, put our legs down um, so that we can uh, get that better blood flow. And we really want to um, watch that closely because we're worried about amputation. Whereas venous, I need to get up and move. I need compression and I need to elevate. So arterial dangle, venous elevate. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, one of the more serious uh, problems that we're, you're going to hear about. When we talk about venous problems, there's some serious stuff that can happen there. But this is probably when you think about like the like, oh my gosh, like one of the worst things that can happen with peripheral vascular disease, this is it. So peripheral artery disease or PAD 
um, is effectively like we've been talking about, um, it's like CAD, but in the legs. So if you remember CAD is plaque accumulation in the coronary arteries um, that can then, um, can then progress to chronic stable angina, um, you know, where they're having that pain when they're doing activities and stuff like that. And that's what happens with peripheral artery disease is effectively there's um, a thickening of the inner lining. And so a lot of times that's plaque build up. And so they become very narrow. So there's less flow. Um, but then, you know, and of course the risk factors are the same as it is for cardiovascular disease. Smoking is bad for it. Diabetes makes it worse. Having kidney disease, high blood pressure, um, obesity, all these things, um, you know, uh, make things more difficult and add to the mix. Um, but, um, you know, effectively at the end result is, is that you have all this buildup that leads to blockages and blood can't get through. And that's where that ischemic process comes in. So this, this patient um, looks, uh, we call it, um, this patient can look very different depending on the patient. Everyone's a little different. Some may have no symptoms or atypical symptoms, but usually, you know, in nursing school, we like to teach you the classic presentation. So the classic presentation of PAD is that they're going to complain of pain with exercise or exertion. And what does that sound like? That sounds just like chronic stable angina. So you can kind of connect those dots there. So, um, you know, that pretty much this is angina in the legs. So they're going to, um, they're going to be fine when they're resting and dangling their legs. Um, but when they're getting up and walking around, they're starting to start to have like uh, that really sharp pain. Like I was talking about, like it's an ischemic pain. Cause there's literally a blockage. Cause remember when you get up and move around, when you exercise, when you exert yourself, your blood vessels vasoconstrict. And if I already have a pretty blocked blood vessel and then I constrict even more, there's no room for flow. Um, what do you call it? This patient's going to say it gets better when they rest. Um, they may have some numbness and tingling or what we call paresthesias. Um, they may describe some sort of shooting or burning pain. Um, and then this is kind of how we end up getting ulcers because again, they can't feel it. So they don't see it when these things come up. Um, you know, some of the late symptoms are going to be, Hey, I'm resting and I'm still hurting, which means they got a lot of blockage there. So kind of think of like in the coronary arteries when it gets really blocked and they need to put a stent in. Um, and it's usually worse at night. And that's because of decreased cardiac output overnight. So in other words, when I'm resting at night, my body's like, Hey guys, it's time to take a break. Um, and so like, you know, I start working on other functions that I don't have time for during the day. Cause I'm busy being a crazy person and making a million PowerPoints. Right. I just kidding. Um, so, um, but, um, it's, um, it's worse, it's worse at night because my cardiac output goes down, which means I have less flow, especially to my extremities. Um, I usually focus on the rest and digestive system um, and things like that. And so um, I, I shot more blood towards my, um, you know, different areas of my body than my extremities. And so then, it, cause I don't need them cause I'm not up walking around. So then what happens is because I have that decreased blood pressure, decreased cardiac output, cause I'm not doing as much is I already have decreased flow down there. And then that pain can sometimes get worse at night because because I have less flow already. It's kind of the same, like think heart failure. Like, you know, if you have less blood out, you're gonna have less blood to deliver to the rest of your um, organs and tissues. Um, so we kind of talked about this earlier, but the painy ha uh, painy patient has shiny tot skin. Um, and so um, they are not getting a lot of flow down there. So their skin can definitely have um, some issues. Like I talked about that hair loss is the only way to um, lose your hair without having to wax. But I do not recommend getting PAD just to get away from, uh, get away with um, not having to shave um, because it's not worth it. There's a lot of consequences like, yeah, you don't have to shave your legs, but you also lose Lose it. We'll talk about this soon. Um, they have diminished pulses. Um, and so um, uh, what do you call it? That's because literally there's less flow there. And so there's going to be a weaker pulse because there's weaker flow. Um, and then they have um, a, uh, if, if we took a patient that had PAD, like in this picture, if you elevated their legs, they're pale. And you have to think about that. If, I, if, I'm, if I'm having trouble getting flow down and then you elevate my legs, that's, that's going against gravity. So I'm going to get even more pale because there's less flow because I'm already fighting gravity. Because uh, Sorry, because I'm, I'm already fighting to get blood flow there. And then you add gravity that I have to climb up. I can't do it. So it's pale when elevated. And, they and then when we go dependent, there's the dependent ruber because um, they finally get flow. It's so excited. It's like, oh, here, finally, um, it can get some flow in. So you have that kind of red color to it. 
So there's a couple diagnostic studies that we can do. Often what they do is we do an ultrasound with a Doppler. So kind of think of the same thing that we like to do where we went and wanted to go in the coronary arteries and look around. So we um, we do that. Um, there, that. There is actually, you can do that, like, you know, like the cath lab procedure, except go into the legs instead. But we also do an ultrasound really to see how blocked we are. That it's less invasive. And we always want to do less invasive first. We want to see what kind of flow is there. And so we can see kind of the percentage of flow if there is any. Um, uh, you know, uh, down. And so like for patients that I've had in the past, there's times that I'm like trying to feel a pulse and I can't feel one. And then I feel a lot better because they come and do an ultrasound and the ultrasound tech is like, yeah, there's nothing flowing down there. So I feel a lot better. I'm like, okay, so if I'm not feeling something, at least I know it's not just me, <laughs> you know, there's actually no flow down there. Um, so we try to see, um, you know, um, if there's any blockages or anything else. Um, and then we also do segmental blood pressures, which where we take the blood pressure on the thigh, calf and ankle. And so that really helps us to see because um, if you think about it, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, if um, usually PAD, like you know, there's a blockage somewhere, and so then as you go down, there's going to be less and less flow as you go down the leg, depending on where the blockage is. Um, but effectively, um, it helps us to kind of see if there's a change in that blood pressure that's showing me there's a blockage. So, in other words, if um, you know, uh, before, like you know, up higher in my leg, I might have a higher blood pressure because I don't have any blockages, but as I go down and there's limited flow because there is a blockage, there are all these plaques, or I have a really narrow vessel because your vessels, remember, they're bigger up in your thighs. And then as you move down, the, those vessels get smaller. And then if I already have all these plaques and other things accumulating, it's just going to get worse. But we look for if there's a drop greater than 30 milligrams of mercury, then um, that's diagnostic of peripheral artery disease. Um, like I said, we can also look inside or get an MRI and see kind of what's going on inside. There's also this measure, uh, measure known as the ABI or the ankle brachial index. Um, and it's, um, we do this with a handheld Doppler and pretty much we take their systolic blood pressure um, uh, in their brachial artery and then also um, their ankle systolic blood pressure um, and we divide those um, to kind of see the difference. And that's gonna tell us a lot about, you know, um, it's pretty much trying to look at um, flow in an area, uh, what do you call it, that probably has very good flow versus like what it should be, because there shouldn't be a, a big difference there. Um, but um, yeah, pretty much it's looking at that ratio and that can tell us like, you know, how severe is their PAD? Now, I don't need, you don't need to go too, too crazy in depth with these numbers and stuff like that, um, knowing mild, moderate, or severe, but kind of knowing what's normal and what's not normal would be helpful um, so that when you're reading through these diagnostic tests in clinical, or when you have a patient like this one day when you're a fabulous nurse that you're going to be, you know what it means. Um, so there's a lot of possible complications. So remember I said the PAD is kind of scary. Like, you know, I think the simple nursing guy says PAD is BAD, it's bad. Um, and I was, that always stick, stuck in my head. Um, and by the way, copyrights. I do not have copyrights to his wonderful um, mnemonics and stuff like that. So um, thank you very much for all that you do, sir. Um, but effectively PAD, there's a, the thing we really worry about is if I'm not getting blood flow, just like I worry about ischemia in the heart leading to cell death and my heart, um, you know, completely dying because I lose all that tissue. I'm worried about tissue dying in my leg as well. And you always have to think about, okay, where's the tissue going to die? It's going to be distal. Where's the blood not flowing and it's not flowing to my toes. So usually kind of like in this picture, you're going to start seeing a breakdown in the toes. So, and then sometimes it usually climbs and can get worse and it can get into the bone and travel. It's not pretty. So, um, you know, this is this kind of black um, color, the escar. Um, it's, it's, it's a sign that there's literally tissue death. Um, and um, a lot of times these patients end up needing to get toes amputated and parts of their foot amputated and then so on and so forth. Um, they can get infected and they, uh, what do you call it? Um, they can require lots and lots of treatment. And again, if that spreads into the rest of the body, it can end up with sepsis and a lot worse problems. Um, but amputation is usually um, the thing we are trying to do, the, um, do our best to prevent. So our first priority is going to be um, adequate peripheral perfusion. And when I say, again, first priority, I just mean this is a top priority, but not necessarily always the first priority. Um, so the first, the, this I should say, I keep wanting to not say first priority. So 
number one thing. No, oh, that, that sounds bad too. One of the things, there we go, I can word things. One of the things we want to um, focus on is making sure they get good blood flow. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we have to see what are our barriers. Well, one of our barriers is that I have a bunch of plaque in my arteries. So I want to decrease that plaque accumulation. I'm gonna give the patient statins or fibric acid derivatives or a different cholesterol medicine. Those are just two examples, um, but we need to decrease the plaques that are building up. Um, the next thing I want to do is I really want to prevent blockages. And if you remember, um, the platelets are the party goers. They're like the troublemakers that are like, oh, you know, what kind of, how can, I, I want to be a part of a clot. I want to be part of a clot party. But platelets are only ever invited to platelet party, parties. And they always want to go to the clot party. So sometimes they stick together and they're like, hey, let's just be losers together and look, go look for clots together. So what, um, you know, we need to do there is we need to make them stick less together so that when, you know, there is like blockages forming that they don't add more fuel to the fire because they're all stuck together and they make that clot or blockage even bigger. So um, we use things like aspirin and clopidogrel, which is Plavix, um, in order to uh, make them less sticky to prevent those bigger blockages. Um, and then the other thing we were probably going to do is maybe a surgical or invasive procedure when it really gets to a point where it's so blocked. <laughs> Um, we call it, they can't, they're not getting flow and serious complications are occurring. We usually will do those surgical interventions to make sure that they have blood flow and maintain blood flow. So um, like I mentioned, one of the things we want to do is make the platelets less sticky. So one of the meds that I talked about was aspirin. Um, so aspirin is considered an NSAID, um, but the thing that you want to keep in mind here is when you're in the hospital and you see a patient on aspirin, if you see a patient on 81 milligrams of aspirin, that is not going to be for pain. And I, I always get my students on this. I'm like, oh, okay, you know, like, why are we giving this? And they always say for pain, but we, we usually don't give aspirin in the hospital for pain. And especially if it's 81 milligrams, we're actually giving it for a prophylaxis to prevent them from platelets sticking together and having cardiac events or cardiac problems. Um, and so um, uh, aspirin is effectively kind of breaking up um, these platelets that are hanging together and so that they don't form like a huge clot on all these plaques that are already accumulated in the arteries. Um, so um, if you're allergic um, you know, to NSAIDs, you um, always wanna consider that allergy. Um, we call the thing about aspirin and all NSAIDs is that they can cause bleeding and GI upsets. So you always wanna tell them to take this with food um, and they should report any ringing in their ears if they're having, um, uh, what do you call it, problems or problems with balance because um, it can have some ototoxicity. Um, there is enteric coated forms that will help to decrease some of those GI symptoms. You want to take it with a full glass of water. Um, and then you want to always ask your doctor if like, you know, you're, you have to have a procedure because the, um, even though this is not an anticoagulant, this is just going to stop, you know, platelets from sticking together. It can cause you to have higher risk of bleeding. So if you're going to have any procedures, you need to talk to your doctor first. The other medication we can take is what's called clopidogrel or Plavix. So these are both antiplatelets. It's really just doctor preference and stuff. And um, uh, there may be different reasons one over the other, but you don't have to know that in depth. Um, but they do the exact same thing. They help the platelets from not sticking together. So this is kind of this picture like, oh, it's a platelet party. And then ever say, hey, what's going on? And then they all get stuck. Like they all get stuck together. They're like, oh, we're stuck here. And then they end up forming like a big uh, clot. And then they're traveling through the through the um, body system and then there's some plaques that they get stuck on. But anyway, um, so same side effects, except they don't have those GI side effects like the um, like really tearing your stomach apart like aspirin does. The main thing is really just the bleeding. So you like this clopidogrel will make your platelets chill. It helps to, pre uh, it helps to prevent blood clots, but also can make you bleed lots. Pretty good, right? Um, and so we want to teach the patient to avoid trauma and injury and, um, you know, really um, they should let their doctor know anytime they experience um, that bleeding and they should never stop it suddenly. Always talk to their doctor first. Mm -hmm. So I also mentioned surgical procedures and um, there's a variety of them. There's an endarterectomy that you can, you open the artery and you scrape out the plaques. Um, there's one where you open the artery, remove the plaques and then um, sew like a patch on it so that the artery is wider and that's called a patch graft angioplasty. Um, there's a PTA, which is pretty much where you go and think like cath lab, like for the heart, but you're going into the leg instead and putting a stent in um, or you can be, um, you know, going in and, 
um, burning off some of the extra plaques and stuff like that, um, or removing the plaques just intra artery. Um, the end arterectomy and the patch graft is where you're cutting into, whereas the PTA is where you're actually going inside, like with the um, uh, with the catheter, um, like they did for the cath lab, or where you would go in the coronary arteries. Same thing though. Um, but the big one that you're going to want to know about is that what's called a fem pop or femoral popliteal bypass graft. And this is effectively, this is like a cabbage surgery, if you know what a cabbage surgery is. What we do is we take a vein um, at, from a different area of the body, because you, um, you can build collateral circulation real easy with these. We take a vein and we effectively, if there's a blockage, we bypass it. We're creating a new pathway. So we just pretty much be like, oh, it's kind of like when you decide, hey, 35 is always going to have traffic on it. I'm going to just start taking a different way. Um, um, and so um, we create a new, um, like in this picture, we create a new blood vessel um, and then the artery, uh, what do you call it, is going to, um, you know, now start using this new path. So we don't cut out the old, we just leave it there. Um, but now this new pathway is formed, so there's no obstruction, so we can actually get flow, um, you know, to the rest of our body. So after a patient has that procedure, um, you know, it's my top assessment is going to be that peripheral neurovascular, really making sure that um, they, uh, what do you call them, um, are have their uh, five P's intact or six P's and one C, I should say. Um, and we're going to talk about those more in the next section when we talk about um, musculoskeletal and stuff like that. But I'm asking them, like, okay, what, uh, I'm asking them, is there any pain? Um, can they move it? Um, is there any numbness and tingling? Um, what do you call them? Um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, what's the temperature of it? What's the color? All of that stuff. Um, and then checking their capillary refill, really seeing is there good perfusion, like all those signs of perfusion I'm looking for. Um, and if there's any changes, I need to report that to the physician right away. Um, it's expected that they're going to have pain and stuff like that, but you know, it's always that pain out of proportion to the injury and things like that. Um, we do aggressive pain management because this is a very painful procedure and we want to tell them to avoid, um, knee flexion. So in other words, um, you know, like I'm sitting up in a chair right now, I wouldn't want them to be sitting up in a chair for a long period of time or prolonged sitting in the dependent position. And this is immediately post-operatively. It's not saying forever they can never sit in a chair or be in a dependent position. And getting up and moving around is going to be very helpful for them. Um, the big thing is, is we just don't want to put a lot of pressure um, postoperatively immediately on that incision. So you see this long incision on their leg. We don't want to put extra pressure on there. So if they sat up for a long time, if they're flexing their knee for a long time, it could put kind of pressure on that incision. Um, but yeah, as they heal, they'll be able to do more. Um, I'm also going to have a focus on activity tolerance. So it's kind of like with the angina where they don't really feel like they can get up and go get around because um, of that pain, that intermittent claudication that they're having. Um, so remember the pain is not because there's actually like an injury at the site. Remember it's because of lack of oxygen. It's an ischemic pain. Um, so there's a couple medications that we can give and these are actually, um, they're like vasodilators that help to um, open up and allow for excuse me, better flow, because it's the same thing. Like, what do we take when we have, um, you know, chronic stable angina? We take a vasodilator that helps to open the coronary arteries. These are more specific to help the arteries in the legs to open up so that I can um, get rid of some of that intermittent claudication pain. I'm also going to teach them that energy conservation and, um, you know, walking's the probably the best exercise for um, peripheral artery disease and to kind of balance the walking and resting. Um, it's not that they, they need to just walk like crazy, but it's just kind of recognizing their limitations and taking it easy and taking um, turns um, between activity and resting. I also need to educate them because education is so important. Just like all these cardiovascular diseases, it's all about modifying risk factors. If they're smoking, they need to quit. Smoking is probably single-handedly um, one of the worst things you can do for your blood vessels. Um, and so if they're smoking, like even if they get all these procedures done, take these medicines, they are just slowly hurting themselves over and over and over again. They've got to quit smoking. Um, and, um, you know, and of course the PC answers there, gently encourage them to quit smoking. Um, we also want them to manage their diabetes because again, I could be doing everything, I'll take all my medicines, getting these procedures done, but if my blood glucose is in the 300s, I'm slowly spearing and killing through my blood vessels. I also want to keep my blood pressure stable because um, if that's high and out of control, it's going to work against um, all these other treatments that I'm doing. Um, weight loss can help, a low sodium diet can also help, um, and 
managing the cholesterol with diet and medication. So not just taking your statins, but also doing a, um, a low fat diet, a heart healthy diet. Um, foot care, like we talked about before, teaching them all that those same diabetic foot care um, tips and tricks, Tell, teaching them how to avoid injury and how to um, like check for problems with their feet. Um, and then they should also learn how to check for perfusion. They should know what are the signs that they're getting good perfusion and what are the signs that maybe there's a problem. All right, so let's get into venous problems. Um, PAD is the main uh, problem for uh, arterial problems. Then for venous problems, we have three things. We have varicose veins, um, thrombophlebitis, and VTE, or um, uh, you know, a blood clots. So um, let's start with some of the more simple stuff. So varicose veins, um, you know, I'm sure that there's many people listening to this video that have them, um, but they're effectively dilated torturous superficial veins. And most of the time, you just you that sometimes you hear them called spider veins. Um, some, uh, you know, I have one named after my son because um, he gave it to me. Thank you, childbirth. Um, but, um, you know, they're from a, uh, like usually too much pressure, um, you know, kind of, um, it's like a dilation of that vessel where it, um, it kind of out pouches. It's actually like, you know, if you want to think about it, it's actually like a hemorrhoid, but in your leg. So um, they, can, they can also occur other places. This is exactly, this is a hemorrhoid. It's just showing up in a different place. Um, some of them, there's no known cause, even though women are more likely to get them than men. Um, but sometimes they can also be caused by trauma or there's maybe a blood clot or other injury. Um, and like I said, they can appear anywhere. Yay. Um, the risk factors um, for this, I marked a few of these because, you know, this is um, what a lot of us um, that are females and nurses and may be watching this uh, may experience. So um, knowing if, if this is not something that applies to you, knowing that your coworkers would be at risk for it and give some good education. Um, so, but some of the big things, um, being female, um, obesity, because that extra pressure, um, especially on your legs, especially if you're someone who has um, where your body is, um, like we're going to talk about this later in the semester, it's like your body shape. You know, some people are um, the apple where they have kind of more round in the middle, it puts more pressure on their legs. Um, and then some people also are kind of the pear shaped and that pear shape, that extra on their hips um, can actually make it harder on your legs. Um, uh, what do you call it? When you have that extra weight on the legs themselves and lead to more pressure. So losing weight we'll talk about is one of the things that can help. Um, Multi-parity, which means having multiple children you can definitely work. Like I said, childbirth gave one to me. Um, and then any occupations that require prolonged sitting or standing. Hmm, who does that sound like? Us, right? So often. So this patient, can, uh, compared to the patient with peripheral artery disease, their symptoms are very different. So this patient's gonna complain more of a heavy, achy feeling or pressure, not a sharp ischemic pain. And again, patients aren't gonna say, oh, I'm having an ischemic pain. They're gonna say, oh, it's really sharp, ouch. You know, where this is more of just like a uh, heavy, achy, dull, um, uncomfortable feeling. Um, there's often swelling of the limbs or restless or tired feeling. Um, and, you know, one of the things I wanna worry about with varicose veins, of course, is gonna be uh, blood clots collection. So um, one of the things I'm going to be trying to manage is their symptoms. Most of the time we just conservatively manage these. These are not something we're rushing out like, quick, get to the hospital. There's a varicose vein. Um, so um, uh, you may get a couple people laughing at you. Um, resting and um, remember, hey, remember, does this look familiar? Rest, elevation, compression stockings. You may be saying no, you said movement, but um, your, some rest sometimes helps, but you can also see here leg strengthening exercises help as well. Um, we do movement to prevent this often, um, but uh, what do you call it? Um, once you have one, rest helps. Uh, what do you call it? Because a lot of times that extra pressure from moving around too much can make things worse when you acutely just got, you know, this varicose vein. So um, it's not saying, hey, if you have varicose veins, you can't go up to your husband and be like, hey, sorry, I have to rest. My professor says if I have varicose veins, I need to conservatively treat it. So I'm not saying you need to rest all the time, but sometimes if you're having like pain and discomfort, it's saying, hey, maybe you need to rest a little bit. Um, limb elevation and compression stocking, stockings and um, strengthening exercises help. Um, so this is not a lack of oxygen problem. Mostly we're just supporting the patient in their uncomfortable symptoms. They can have cosmetic procedures to have them removed, but it's not actually going to fix the problem. So like, for example, if my problem is, is that I weigh too much, I stand for too long. Um, I'm a female, so I'm already more at risk. I've had multiple babies. Like those are my risk factors. And, I, and all 
altering some of those, the ones that I can, I can't change some of those. Um, but I'm altering what I can with those. That's what I need to do. Cause if I can go and have like my, um, the one that my son gave me through childbirth removed. But if I'm still overweight, standing on my legs, all the, or standing on my feet all the time, putting pressure on my legs um, and have all those other risk factors, it doesn't really matter if I get the other one removed, another one's just going to come in. So um, again, it's mostly for the look of it. And so you can kind of see here, this is the, um, like there's some, uh, Sclerotherapy, um, it destroys the varicose veins, varicose veins. There's laser therapy. They can do ablations. They can actually literally go in and take the um, for torturous vessel out. So a lot of people do it for the look of it because they want their um, their legs to look a certain way. You know, they don't like the appearance of it. Um, but just keep in mind when you're you know educating people on this, this is not going to fix their problem. It's just going to um, take away this varicose vein. But if they don't change lifestyle, it's not going to help them long term. So the teaching I wanna give so that they can help prevent this stuff and um, help them more long-term is they should avoid sitting or standing for long periods of time. Um, avoid wearing really constrictive clothing, especially constrictive around the waist. If I wear really tight pants, it puts more pressure and kind of uh, makes it harder. Um, where more fluid is gonna pull in my legs and create that pressure, which can dilate those um, veins. Um, and the walking program. So you kind of see here. So when I have an acute pain or problems with varicose veins, I may need to rest. But in order to prevent myself from getting them in the first place, walking helps. So walking, compression, um, and what did I forget the third one? Walking, compression, and where is it? Elevation. There we go. I'm, it's obviously late at night. So um, what do you call it? Um, elevation. Um, compression and walking um, will all help. Um, and then, like I said, managing those risk factors, trying to help with um, weight loss and uh, modifying the job. Or, you know, you know, a lot of times people say, well, I'm a nurse, I can't do any different. But there's a lot of times things that we decide to do on a day-to-day -day basis as a nurse that um, we kind of set ourselves up for trouble. So then I said, there's also phlebitis. This is usually referred to as thrombophlebitis because usually um, there's um, you know a little clot or something that causes irritation in the um, blood vessel. And this is not a blood clot, um, like we're going to talk about here in a second. Um, but what's happening here is usually there, what, what, what happened is that I had an IV or other device inserted inside of me. And, you know, my body's like, Hey, there's something here. It's not supposed to be here. And it kind of forms, kind of starts forming this barrier around it. It can lead to this inflammatory process, which leads to, um, kind of these symptoms like this pain, tenderness, warm to touch redness. Um, and so, um, what you're going to notice when you do your IV assessment, you're going to notice like redness around the site. Um, it's going to be tender to touch when you flush it that may hurt um, and um, the patient's gonna say oh take this thing out of me um, and so you know for this um, some of it makes sense like we're gonna we're gonna elevate it we're going to put on um, give some like anti-inflammatories um, but a lot of people don't understand hey it's red and hot why would you put heat on it um, keep in mind heat especially moist heat helps to decrease inflammation and so that's going to help me um, overall so that I can um, decrease some of those uncomfortable symptoms the patient's feeling. So raise it up, put a heat pack on it, and let that inflammation subside. So this kind of shows you some examples. This is phlebitis where there's inflammation in the vein. They get red, and you can even see here's where, you know, obviously there's something very irritating in the patient's, um, in the blood vessels of that patient. So last but not least is the, um, so, you know, kind of PAD, um, peripheral artery disease, that's like the big heavy hitter for artery problems. VTE is the big heavy hitter, he, hitter for um, venous problems. So if you know, like um, the other two in the middle, the varicose veins and thrombophlebitis, you're going to get tested over those, but they're not, you know, they're not as life or death as VTE and PAD. So these are the ones you really want to get on and really get a handle on because you're going to see a lot of patients that are either at risk for these or that have these. So what VTE is, and like I said, you might hear venous thromboembolism, you might hear um, VTE, you might hear blood clot. Um, these all mean the same thing. Um, so um, it's pretty much there's a formation of a blood clot within a vein, remember a vein, not an artery, and that leads to inflammation, just like what we just talked about with um, thrombophlebitis, but it's not because there's an IV or something else inserted. Um, it can be, but um, it's, it's more in a big blood vessel, because usually when we're talking about VTE, we're talking about DVT, another acronym. I know you guys love that there's so many acronyms, which is deep vein thrombosis. Um, and so some risk factors that we're going to see with uh, VTE or DVT 
or well, I was gonna, oh, I thought there was another one, BTE, DVT. No, there's only two. Sorry, I was going to try to come up with another one, but I promise I think that's it. Um, but um, with this, you're going to see, um, you know, some stuff that we've already talked about, like atrial fibrillation. Remember, that's a very, um, that's like probably one of the um, biggest contributing factors to blood clots, um, but also um, being immobile. And so we're going to kind of talk about, this is why in the hospital patients are what's on what's called VTE prophylaxis, or we're trying to prevent blood clots. So we put them on a medicine that's going to help to thin their blood a little bit so that they're less at risk because they're immobile because they're stuck in the hospital and they're bedridden. Um, so there's some other, um, you know, possible contributing factors, but this is what we have over here is what we call Virchow's triad. And these three factors are what kind of um, put you at risk. So when you're thinking about, you know, instead of trying to memorize a long list and be like, oh, here's all the risk factors for blood clots. Think about this. The three main things that cause blood clots are um, when it says circulatory stasis. And what that means is my blood is still. So like, you know, or pooling. So think of what things cause pooling of blood. So we already talked about atrial fibrillation. There's pooling of blood in the atria. Um, but then we also just talked about that in venous problems, there's pooling of blood in the lower extremity. So that's going to be another risk factor. So that kind of tells you here, I need to connect with this. Hey, when there's pooling of blood, I should think blood clots. So that's one uh, of the factors. Another factor is going to say is what it calls here endothelial damage or dysfunction. So in other words, it's talking about um, when there's actually damage to the inside of the vein. So this could be because like it said here, there's like a, an IV or a catheter put in in a big blood vessel. Um, it could be from um, plaque buildup, but the, um, you know, there's something that's in the lining of the blood vessel that is breaking down. Um, so, you know, go back to everything we learned about coronary artery disease that effectively, you know, there's plaques building up and then eventually sometimes those can rupture and then a clot forms and that's when blockages start to form and patients start to have angina and then they can progress to having a heart attack. So the same thing's happening except when that clot, that's how that clot forms. Um, and so um, anytime there's breakdown to the walls of the blood vessel, um, uh, you know, that's when we're going to be worried about formation of a clot. Um, that can come with, um, what do you call it, that damage to the inner lining. So, and then the last big risk factor is going to be what's called a hypercoagulable state. So in other words, this is going to be times where um, we're more likely to form blood clots. And so some things that can affect that is going to be like, hey, when, uh, when you're pregnant or on hormonal birth control and stuff like that, it changes your hormones and those hormones can actually increase your risk. So like I had a friend that perfectly healthy, like one of the healthiest people I know, marathon runner, um, you know, really in shape and she was on birth control. And because of other, she probably had like a genetic or other um, risk factor there. She ended up getting a pulmonary embolism because she got a blood clot and it traveled to her lung. We'll talk about that soon. Don't worry. Um, and um, it was, and they traced it back that it was all because of her birth control, which is pretty crazy. Um, but, you know, pretty much um, when people are on certain therapies and stuff like that, um, also like when they have certain conditions, like inflammatory conditions, like sepsis or inflammatory bowel disease, um, they're more likely to make clots. So this is kind of the triad. It's like, if you're staying still, if you have damage to your art, uh, you know, arteries, excuse me, if you have damage to your veins, and if you um, or have some condition going on that's causing you to clot more often or be more likely to clot, you know, these are your risk factors here. It's saying like, here's the times that you really need to watch out for. You don't have to have all three in order for um, this to happen. You can have just one risk factor, but instead of trying to memorize a long list, it's thinking about, okay, what things um, would cause my, um, you know, circulatory system to stop? Like where's the pool? In other words, let me reword it in a better way. When do I pull blood? And then you want to yourself, when does the lining of my blood vessels break down? When am I in that hypercoagulable state? And so those are some examples, but I highly recommend kind of more thinking about the general situations, but instead of trying to memorize a list. So what does a patient with a blood clot look like? Um, there is what's called SVT, not supraventricular tachycardia. I know you love your, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, EKG rhythms, but I'm talking about superficial 
um, a vein thrombosis. So um, what happens with that is since it's superficial, they usually have itchy skin, can be tender, painful, or red as well. And they have a firm cord-like vein um, appearance that's, uh, what do you call it, um, to that blood vessel. It's cord-like because it's really inflamed and irritated. Um, we don't, you know, those happen um, and they require some treatment sometimes, but uh, most of the time um, they're not as concerning as what we call a deep vein thrombosis. And we're worried about a deep vein thrombosis because these blood vessels are going to travel straight back to your heart. And then that, um, that uh, blood clot, if it travels, can cause a lot, a lot of problems. Um, so a deep vein thrombosis, um, what you're going to be noticing in this patient is unilateral, which means one-sided leg edema. And so this is one of the um, ways, like, you know, if you have a patient that comes in and you're trying to figure out if they have a blood clot or not, look at their legs, um, kind of measure and compare. And usually you're going to see that one is significantly larger than the other. They can also have redness, pain, and tenderness in one leg. Um, they may describe a sense of fullness, um, and they can't even have a fever from that inflammatory process. And you won't have to, uh, what do you call it, um, get too deep, like looking like deep versus superficial, but just kind of look at those differences. You know, the superficial is going to have a cord-like appearance because you can actually see it because it's superficial. It's on the surface. Um, whereas the deep vein thrombosis, most of the symptoms are going to be more deeper in there. So they may not have something as visible um, aside from, um, you know, the, like the edema or the size of the leg, but you're not going to see something as on the skin as much as they're going to have symptoms a little deeper down. Um, so there's also, um, of course, diagnostic studies that we want to do for um, these blood clots. And so we want to do usually like the main test we do is a Doppler or an ultrasound, and they can tell us if there's a blood clot. Um, and um, they do this often if they suspect it. And sometimes they may tell you, hey, you have a blood clot in your like right lower leg, you don't need to um, run and like, be like, Oh my God, I gotta, you know, um, I gotta go do something major, you know, like the patient's about to die. So, you know, when blood clots, um, once they're there, when there's already a blood clot there, you definitely need to notify your doctor and let them know, but it's not like the patient's having a heart attack, if that makes sense. Um, this isn't in an artery, so it's not necessarily going to cause the same ischemia that you're probably used to. Um, and, um, you know, once there is a blood clot there, unless it's um, causing like really significant blockage, most of the time what we do, our goal, and we'll talk about this here in a second, is to stop more clots from forming. But we're usually not busting clots with a, a DVT. Usually what we're doing is just managing and preventing them from getting more clots formed. Um, we also can do a CT or MRI um, to kind of start... Um, uh, what was I going to say? A CT or MRI to um, kind of visualize if we think there's a bigger problem going on. Um, and then we're going to do labs. We want to um, look at a couple different things. And these labs can be confusing. So I kind of broke them down here. First, we want to know, is the patient clotting? Because this is going to help tell us, like, is there some process in the patient's body that's causing them to clot more? Um, so we're going to get their APTT, INR, maybe platelet count, see what those platelets are doing if they're getting into trouble. Um, then we want to see is the patient bleeding because, um, you know, it definitely can go uh, both ways. And we're going to talk about how some medications we have to give for these patients can put them at higher risk for bleeding. So getting like a hematocrit and a hemoglobin, the hemoglobin would be the key one there. Um, and then the one that's very specific to DVT is what's called a D-dimer. And um, what this is, is this actually is a, um, it's a measure of breakdown products of a clot. So if this is present, they're saying, hey, somewhere in your body, you have a clot because you have the materials that you need for a clot just floating around. Um, and when there's really high levels of that, it's saying, hey, there's a clot somewhere in your body. It's just been breaking off everywhere. Um, so um, what do you call them? That D-dimer being elevated really says you can't, you don't know where the clot is and you don't know why you have the clot, but you know that there's some, a clot somewhere floating around in your system. So my first priority, um, and again, I'll reiterate, one of my priorities is gonna be um, preventing further clots, adequate perfusion. So again, we don't break down the clot that's already there, but we wanna stop more from forming. So we're gonna start on anticoagulation. And there's gonna be another video that's kind of breaking down a real short video about anticoagulation versus antiplatelet and kind of um, breaking down that difference there because a lot of people find that confusing. Um, they're usually going to have lifelong anticoagulation therapy um, for their DVT. Some of them may only be temporary, depends on the clot and stuff like that, <clears throat> and the patient's age and other risk factors, um, like why they got the clot, et cetera. Um, but they need to really learn what bleeding precautions are, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. 
and the big treatment is this anticoagulation. So um, most often they're given, um, you know, an oral pill to be on for the rest of their life, which may be warfarin. Um, while they're in the hospital, they may receive a heparin or a loganox, which is also known as anoxaparin. Anoxaparin and heparin are the names you want to know. Um, and so there's a couple different choices here, and there's also some new age agents. So let's break down, because if you believe it or not, there's more meds. Um, so let's first start with warfarin. So this is one of the most common medications you're going to see patients prescribed um, when they need an anticoagulant. Um, and it actually is a, um, a rat poison. So sometimes, you know, some patients, especially older ones, are like, oh, come bring me my rat poison if you're like... What are they talking about? This is what they're referring to. Um, so warfarin takes a little bit of time to start working. Um, so usually we start the patient when they come to the hospital, if they have a blood clot or at risk for blood clots, um, we start them on heparin first because that's going to work right away. Um, whereas this is going to take some time to take effect. So we do what's called a bridge is that we'll start them on the heparin and then we'll start giving the warfarin at the same time, um, you know, and then um, once the warfarin's therapeutic, then we'll stop taking the heparin. Um, so we're, for this section, you're going to see that for these labs, there, uh, that for these meds, there's a particular lab that matches this. So in other words, you could just kind of how, like how I, I sometimes say, hey, this lab is specific, like a BNP, N is a Nancy, um, is specific to heart failure, and INR is specific to warfarin. So in other words, um, when I'm looking at how my warfarin's doing, like, do I have enough? Am I therapeutic? The only lab that can really tell me that is an INR. A PTT can't tell me that. A PT can't tell me that. I need an INR. Um, and so um, the therapeutic range is between two and three. And I have another video that's on um, therapeutic monitoring. And I highly recommend watching that because a lot of students get confused between what is normal for these lab values and then what's therapeutic. And I want a therapeutic level. And just to sim, I'm not going to go too deep into this. Um, again, watch those other videos if you find this confusing, but effectively, I want to, um, you know, this is telling me how many seconds it's taking me to form a clot. Um, and uh, normally, I'm, you know, um, like less than one second to form a clot. Um, but I want it to be a little bit longer, because if I'm taking less than a second to form a clot, then I'm going to be more likely to make clots, and I want to be less likely to make clots. But I also don't want to just be like, hey, whatever, I'm not making any clots, because what, um, but I'm about to bleed to death. Like if it's taking me so long to form um, a clot, then I'm going to just end up bleeding out. So effectively, I'm trying to get in between the balance of, um, you know, that therapeutic range where I'm, I'm going to be less likely to make a clot. So I'm not down here where I'm very likely to make a clot, and but I'm not all the way up here where I'm gonna most likely bleed. So um, between two and three, so less than um, less than two, I'm at risk for clotting. Greater than three, I'm at risk for bleeding. Um, there's an antidote for this. So if I had too much warfarin, which this happens all the time, so like the therapeutic range is two to three, and I've had people come in with a INR of 13 or 20 and stuff like that, sometimes some really crazy stuff. Um, and uh, for those people, we give the antidote. So we reverse it, we can give vitamin K or FFP. Um, the worst side effect is gonna be that bleeding. Um, we're going to tell them to not drastically change their diet. And you might hear mixed things about this. A lot of people will say, don't eat green leafy vegetables, but effectively you just don't want to, um, to suddenly start um, increasing your intake. So um, if I'm a person who already, like, I just love green leafy vegetables, um, I don't need to change that I'm eating those because my body's used to that. But I, if I was like, man, my health's declining, I really need to start eating better while I'm starting this medicine. I don't need to start eating salads constantly all of a sudden if I never did that before. I don't want to drastically increase what I'm already doing. Um, we don't want to take any other drugs that are going to cause bleeding. So think of some of the other antiplatelets and <coughs> excuse me, other medications we talked about. Um, and here's a couple of mnemonics that uh, might help you along the way, by the way. So the other uh, medication, and this is one that you're only going to see in the hospital. I've never seen someone go home on heparin. We can go home on low molecular weight heparin, um, but most of the time we prefer pills when possible. Um, but this is a medication you're going to commonly give to patients in the hospital, what's known as heparin. Um, it can be given sub-Q, and it's also the, um, the only one that you're on the floor. There are some IV anticoagulants that we use in cath lab. You may see them listed in your book or in your Lily book. Um, and keep in mind, those are just used for cath lab. The only one we ever really use IV is going to be heparin. Um, so kind of think of like regular insulin is the only one that can be given IV. Heparin is really the only one we use IV at like me the nurse that I'm going to be managing unless I'm, again, a specialist. 
Um, and we only use heparin IV if a patient has an active blood clot, like a really, really serious problem, like they're um, like a uh, like a really bad, like a, a new blood clot, um, or if they had something bigger going on, like a pulmonary embolism, et cetera. So um, most of the time, we're just going to give it subcutaneous. It's going to be given a shot. And for heparin, we usually give it like three times a day subcutaneously. Um, it has a very short half-life and you have to think about a half-life is how long it lasts. Um, and you want to think, is this a good or a bad thing? And most people would say, oh, well, that's bad. It's a short half-life, but it's actually a really good thing. The reason why we put people on heparin in the hospital is because I want to put them on a medication that's going to help them so that they, um, uh, what do you call them? If I, if let's say, I, I let, me, let me put it this way. I want them on a medication that's going to prevent them from having blood clots. They're immobile in the bed. They are high risk, or maybe they already have a blood clot. I don't know. Doesn't matter. So I want them on something to protect them. So they either don't get blood, they don't get any new blood clots. If, if they already have one, you know, it's helping and stuff like that. It's not going to break down the blood clot. I'm trying, I'm getting tangled in my own words. Pretty much what I'm trying to say is I want them to be on something to protect them, um, you know, for us. But when I'm in the hospital too, I have to sometimes get stuff done. Like I need procedures, procedures where they might need to cut into me um, or procedures that might make me bleed. And so if I'm on a medication that's going to cause me to bleed, I want that protection, but I also don't want it to last forever. So the great thing about heparin is like, I can have a patient on a heparin drip and then um, we can turn it off like an hour or two before surgery. And then that's out of their system within an hour. I forget how long the half-life is, but I want to say that half-life of heparin is only a few hours. Um, and so um, it's really easy for them to, you know, transition to procedures that may cause them to bleed without having to worry about the consequences. So heparin, this is why we use it in the hospital, protects us, but we can take it off if we need to, and we're not having that serious bleeding long-term. <clears throat> Whereas warfarin and some of the other ones, it's going to take a little bit longer for them to come out of our system. So like I mentioned, we usually do sub-Q, but if I am gonna have a continuous IV infusion, I'm going to monitor the APTT. And that therapeutic, again, remember that happy range, that range where I'm not clotting, but I'm not bleeding, um, that happy range in the middle, um, that's uh, where I wanna be is 46 to 70 seconds. It's the same thing, um, you know, kind of like the INR, it's just a different measure. So just like INR goes with warfarin, APT goes, APTT goes with heparin. And keep in mind, you know, if you're in the hospital um, given the heparin shot three times a day, um, you know, for that patient in real life, we don't monitor the APTT for people that are getting sub-Q. We only monitor it for IV patients. However, you know, we may keep an eye on it um, just in case to make sure that it's not getting too crazy out of whack. Um, the one thing we always want to monitor, no matter what kind of, um, whether it's sub-Q, IV, um, whether it's um, this type of heparin or low molecular weight heparin we're going to talk about in a second, we always want to monitor um, platelet count. And so you can see at the bottom here, one of the side effects of heparin is going to be what's called HIT or heparin induced thrombocytopenia. And effectively what happens is that um, uh, your body starts to attack its platelets and starts breaking them down those poor platelets. <clears throat> they live such a hard life. So um, effectively um, your platelets get started getting breaking down. So like normally like a normal platelet count is like 150 to 400,000. Um, and um, uh, you know, so what, what happens is like maybe your platelet counts like 200,000 and you start heparin, you'll notice like a steep drop, like it'll drop from like 200,000 to like 100,000, it'll drop to 50,000 and like really steep drops. And that's usually, I'm um, telling you that this patient's reacting to this medication, so it needs to be stopped. And there's alternative medications we can use. Sorry for all the coughing. <coughs> that's what happens with these long videos, talking too much. Um, so what happens is effectively um, the platelets get broken down and we need to switch them to a different medication because this one their body is reacting to. Um, long-term heparin can also cause osteoporosis. So this is not something I want someone to be on long-term if I can help it, which is why a lot of times we also prefer those other oral agents. Um, and uh, what do you call them? The only other thing I didn't mention is that just like um, warfarin has that reversal agent through FFP or vitamin K, heparin has a reversal agent through what's known as protamine sulfate. So I've talked about unfractionated heparin, and this is the heparin you're usually going to, um, you're, you're probably very familiar with giving, we give it subcutaneously in the hospital. Um, and again, if a patient has an active blood clot, we may give it IV. Um, 
The other option is what's called low molecular weight heparin or LMWH. And what this is, you've probably seen this one too, it's what's called Lovenox. Um, but remember the name you need to know is anoxaparin. So this one is used in the hospital and this one, you may see it used more often than just the general heparin. And the reason is, is because <coughs> excuse me, sorry for that. Um, the reason that we see this used more often is, is that it has a longer half, uh, sorry, that it has a um, less chance of side effects. So they found that with this low molecular weight heparin, there's less chances of the HIT syndrome um, and also less chances of the osteoporosis. The big bonus with the low molecular weight heparin is unlike the regular heparin where you need to monitor the APTT, this one needs no therapeutic monitoring. So all you need to do is give it um, and it can reach a steady state. It has a longer half-life. So this one, you'd have to wait a little bit longer before having surgery, but it's still not as bad as warfarin where you have to wait days. Um, it has the same antidote as, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, it has the same antidote as heparin because it is, sorry about that, I had to get some water. Um, but what I was saying is, is that it has the same antidote because it is the same type of medication. It's just a little bit of a different preparation. Um, so kind of to sum up so far, we have warfarin, which is an oral pill. It's very commonly used. It takes a little while to get started. Um, we have to kind of watch sometimes some of the foods that we're eating with it um, to make sure that it stays effective. Um, and it needs therapeutic monitoring. We need to keep it that narrow range. Then we have heparin that's unfractionated heparin. We can give it subcutaneously or we can give it IV and we need to monitor the APTT and keep it in that nice narrow range um, and be watching out because they can have short-term, they can have problems with their platelets or long-term, they can have problems with their bones with osteoporosis. Then we have low molecular weight heparin, um, which um, what doesn't have any therapeutic monitoring, it has less side effects, um, but it does stay in your system a little bit longer. Um, and so, um, you know, obviously this is a doctor your choice. You're never going to have to choose in a question like which one's the best choice for them, but you just need to know, okay, I am a, I'm a nurse. I'm taking care of a patient that's on this med. What kind of things am I going to be concerned or worried about? Now let's talk about some of the new oral anticoagulants. So um, here's um, a couple of the main ones that you might see out there. Water break. Um, there's what's known as the Bigotran or Pradaxa. And you know, the benefit of all of these is that there's no therapeutic monitoring. Just like the low molecular weight heparin, we do not have to regularly monitor these medications. Um, there's also the river roxaban, I can't say his name, and the pixaban. Um, and you know, the, it used to be really concerning because uh, people like, you know, these, this was like a big hit when these first came out because it was like, oh man, you know, all these people that have been on warfarin for years and having to go to the doctor and getting poked all the time, getting their blood drawn, checking for their INR, they were so tired of it so they were so excited it's like hey here's this medicine you don't have to do any monitoring with it but you know um what the problem was in the beginning is there was no reversal agents and i'm pretty sure now all of them have reversal agents but one of the big downsides is they're more expensive as with everything you know it's like here here's this medicine that's a lot more convenient for you but you're going to pay out your ears in order to take it um, so my other, you know, my first priority was just, of course, you know, making sure I have adequate perfusion or that there's less blood clots and I'm going to take my anticoagulant for that. Um, but, you know, the other thing I want to do is prevent complications and do very good education. I mean, first and foremost, I want to prevent blood clots at all. I would love for a patient not to have a blood clot. So remember, we talked about all those things that are going to help to prevent blood clots. So remember venous, we uh, venous, you know, we, what elevation. We want movement and compression. So SCDs and compression stockings on patients, um, that VTE prophylaxis, whether it's chemical, like through um, that warfarin or, uh, not warfarin, excuse me, the heparin or um, Lovenox shots daily, um, or maybe um, we're gonna be encouraging them to do exercise, get up and walk around, et cetera. Um, and then um, we also want to prevent complications of their drug therapy. So we're going to teach them to prevent trauma and injury, uh, monitor their, um, like we want to monitor their uh, therapeutic levels if it's appropriate. Um, it is your job as the nurse to know, hey, when do I need to check levels? When do I not need to check levels? Um, and we need to know, of course, you know, there's those reversal agents. I would become familiar with those. Um, if serious bleeding does occur, we're going to give that reversal agent. Um, 
And I always tell the story about this one student, um, not a student, excuse me, they were a brand new nurse um, and um, they were very prudent nurse, great nurse. And um, they kind of had some bad luck in that they hung a heparin drip and um, someone you know, with heparin drips um, at most hospitals, you have to have two nurses sign off. So a nurse came, checked everything, everything looks good. Um, they um, signed off that that nurse went to lunch. And when she came back, her pump was beeping and it said the bag was empty. And she's like, what's going on? I just hung this bag. That bag should have lasted for days. Well, there was a pump malfunction. She didn't do anything wrong on her end. There was a pump malfunction. The entire bag of heparin went into this patient. It should have gone over over days. That whole bag should have gone in. And um, so and it went over within like an hour or 30 minutes. And so the patients like APTT came back undetected detectable because it was so high. Um, and so um, at the end of the day, we had to give them a lot of uh, a lot of vitamin K <laughs> is all I'll say. Um, but these things can happen. So you definitely want to um, know what your reversal agents are and be prepared to give them if something happens. So it may seem like, oh, okay, well, if I give too much, no big deal. I just give the reversal. But the thing you have to always consider here is if I'm at risk for blood clots and I'm taking a medicine to prevent me from having blood clots, uh, maybe it gets too high and I, you know, we're reverse it. What's the issue there? Well, then I'm going to be back at risk for blood clots. Cause remember, it's kind of like, here's like, here's the area. Hey, here I'm at risk for blood clots here. I'm therapeutic here. I'm at risk for bleeding. I want to be in that happy middle range. If I get too far here, I want to kind of get back to that therapeutic range. I don't want to go from here, like, Hey, high risk for bleeding and go all the way to high risk for clotting. I really want to stay in that middle range with these patients um, in order so that there's not complications. Um, so uh, this teaching with, for bleeding precautions is super important. And you're going to see this throughout um, multiple semesters and different medications, but it's very important to understand what bleeding precaution means. Um, you know, a lot of this teaching is also going to help to prevent blood clots in general. Um, so hydration is one of the, is a very helpful thing. So remember one of that Virchow's triad, that triangle was um, hypercoagulability, um, which means really thick blood. So one of the things that's going to help to prevent me from having such thick blood is going to be hydration, so encouraging fluids. Um, part of bleeding precautions while patients are on anticoagulants would also be to avoid trauma or other injury. So I should tell the patient no contact sports, high risk activities, and if they're an older adult, they may need fall prevention education. Um, one second. I'm also going to encourage them to um, report any signs that they're having bleeding. That might be black tar stools. Um, if they're having bleeding on their gums when they're brushing their teeth, um, <laughs> bloody urine, anything coming up. Think of all the areas that you can have blood come out, whether it's your nose, your mouth, um, peeing, pooping, et cetera. You wanna look um, pretty much at every orifice where like blood could come out and make sure that there's no problems in any of those areas. Um, they should avoid, um, and I mean, us as the nurse, we should avoid doing IM injections because they have higher chance of bleeding when possible. Um, if bleeding does occur, we're going to have to hold pressure for longer. So you should always think of this. If you're taking an IV out in a patient, the nurse is like, hey, student, do you want to take an IV out? And you're like, yeah, you might want to ask, hey, is the patient on an anticoagulant? Because they probably are, because most patients are on heparin or Lovenox when they're in the hospital. Um, and so it's really putting that pressure um, for a little bit longer. And you may say, oh, no, it's not a big deal. But I've had patients I like, oh, yeah. It looks good. I put a bandaid on and then five seconds later, they're like, oh, ma'am, I'm bleeding all over my bed. So you definitely want to be extra careful. Um, and then you want to tell them to avoid other things that are going to make bleeding worse, like aspirin and NSAIDs, fish oil and Bactrim, all of those um, increase your risk for bleeding. Um, and then alcohol um, also um, puts you at higher risk for bleeding. Um, it, it is a natural anticoagulant. And so you want to um, use caution in mixing those together. So overall, that is your vascular disorders in depth, down and dirty. And I know I talked around in circles a little bit, but hopefully this was helpful um, to get you kind of um, thinking and understanding more about how to take care of these patients that may have these vascular disorders. See you guys next time.